So Long a Letter by Maria Moba. So Long a Letter by Maria Moba, Chapter 6. Do you remember the morning train that took us for the first time to Pontevale? The teacher's training college in Sabokotani? Pontevale is a countryside still green from the last rains, a celebration of youth right in the middle of nature. Banjo music and dormitories transformed into dance floors. Conversations held along the rows of geraniums or under the thick mango trees. More than four, the very moment you bowed before me, asking me to dance, I knew you were the one I was waiting for. Tall and athletically built, of course. Olive-colored skin, due to your distant Morris blood. No question. Virility and fineness of features, harmoniously blended. Once again, no question. But, above all, you knew how to be tender. You could fathom every thought, every desire. You knew many undefinable things, which glorified you and sealed our relationship. As we danced, your forehead, hairline already receding, bent over my own, the same happy smile lit up our faces, the pressure of our hand became more tender, more possessive. Everything in me gave in, and our relationship endured the school years and during the holidays. Strengthened in me by the discovery of your subtle intelligence, of your embracing sensitivity, of your readiness to help, of your ambition, which suffered no mediocrity. It was this ambition which led you on leaving school to prepare for your own, for the two examinations of the baccalaureate. Then you left for France, and according to your letters, you lived there as a recluse. Attaching little importance to the glitters that met your regard, but you grasp the deep sense of history that has worked so many wonders and of a great culture that overwhelmed you. The murky complexion of the woman had no hold on you. Again, quoting from your letters, on the strictly physical plane, the white woman's advantage over the black woman lies in the variety of her color, the abundance, length, and softness of her hair. There are also eyes which can be blue, green, often the color of new honey. You also used to complain of the somberness of the skies, under which no coconut trees waved their tops. You miss the swinging hips of black women walking along the pavement. This gracious deliberate slowness characteristic of Africa, which charmed your eyes. You were sick at heart at the dog rhythm of the life of the people and the numbing effect of the cold. You will finish by saying that your studies were your staff, your batteries. You will end with a strange of endearment and conclude by reassuring me, as you whom I carry within me, you are my protecting black angel. Would I go quickly find you, if only to hold your hand tightly, so that I may forget hunger and thirst and loneliness, and you return in triumph with a degree in law, in spite of your voice and gift of oratory, you prefer obscure work, less well paid but constructive for your country, to the showiness of the lawyer. Your achievement did not stop there. Your introduction of your friend, Mauduba, into our circle was to change the life of my best friend Aisetu. I no longer scored my mother's reserve concerning you. For a mother can instinctively feel where her child's happiness lies. I no longer laugh when I think that she found you too handsome, too polished, too perfect for a man. She often spoke of the wide gap between your two upper incisors, the sign of primacy of sensuality in the individual. What didn't she do from then on to separate us? She could see in you only the eternal carcassus the uniform of your school. All she remembered of you were your visits, considered too long. You were very idle, she said. Therefore, with plenty of time to waste, and you will use the time to stuff my head, 
to the disadvantage of more interesting young people. Because, being the first pioneers of the promotion of African women, there were very few of us. Men would call us scatterbrained, others labeled as devils, but many wanted to possess us. How many dreams did we nourish hopelessly that could have been fulfilled as lasting happiness and thus we abandoned to embrace others? Those that have burst miserably like soap bubbles, leaving us empty-handed. So long a letter by Maria Moba, Chapter 7 I said to, I will never forget a white woman who was the first to desire for us an uncommon destiny. Together, let us recall our school. Green, pink, blue, yellow, a veritable rainbow. Green, blue, and yellow, the colors of the flowers everywhere in the compound. Pink, the color of the dormitories, where the birds impeccably made. Let us hear the walls of our school come to life with the intensity of our study. Let us relieve its intoxicating atmosphere at night, while the evening song, our joint prayer, rang out full of hope. The admission policy, which was based on entrance examination for the whole of former French West Africa, was now broken up into autonomous republics, made possible a fruitly blend of different intellects, characters, manners, and customs. Nothing differentiated us, apart from specific racial features. The phone girl from Dahomey and the Malinke one from Guinea, friendships were made that have endured the test of time and distance. We were true sisters, destined for the same mission of emancipation. To lift us out of the bog of tradition, superstition and custom, to make us appreciate a multitude of civilizations without renouncing our own, to raise our vision of the world, cultivate our personalities, strengthen our qualities, to make up for our inadequacies, to develop universal moral values in us. These were the aims of our admirable headmistress. The word love had a particular resonance in her. She loved us without patronizing us, with our plates either standing on end or bent down, with our loose blouses or wrappers. She knew how to discover and appreciate our qualities. How I think of her, if the memory of her has triumphed over the ingratitude of time, now that flowers no longer smell as sweetly or as strongly as before, now that age and mature reflection has stripped our dreams of their poetic virtue, it is because the path chosen for our training and our blooming has not been all fortuitous. It has accorded with profound choices made by New Africa for the promotion of the black woman. Thus, free from frustrating taboos and capable now of discernment, why should I follow my mother's finger pointing at Dauda Dane, still a bachelor but too mature for my 18 years? Working as an African doctor at a polyclinic, he was well-to-do and knew how to use his position to advantage. His villa, perched on a rock on the Cronish facing the sea, was the meeting place for the young elite. Nothing was missing, from the refrigerator containing its pleasant drinks to the record player which exuded sometimes languorous, sometimes frenzied music. Dauda Dean also knew how to win hearts. Useful presents for my mother, ranging from a sack of rice, appreciated in that period of war penry, to the frivolous gifts from me, daintily wrapped in paper and tied with ribbons. But I preferred the man in the eternal khaki suits. Our marriage was celebrated without diary, under the disapproving looks of my father, before the painful indignation of my frustrated mother, under the sarcasm of my surprised sisters, in our town, struck down with astonishment. So long a letter by Mariamaba, chapter 8. Then came your marriage with Mauduba, 
recently graduated from the African School of Medicine and Pharmacy. A controversial marriage. I can still hear the angry rumors in town. What? Etsukule, marrying a goldsmith's daughter? He would never make money. Maudu's mother is a Diophany, a Galiwa from the Sene. What an insult to her before her co wives. Maudu's father was dead. In their desire to marry a short skirt, come what may, this is what one gets. School has turned our girls into devils who lure our men away from the right path. And I haven't recounted all, but Maudu remained firm. Marriage is a personal thing, he retorted to anyone who cared to listen. He emphasized his total commitment to his choice of life partner by visiting your father, not at home, but at his workplace. He will return from his outings eliminated, happy to have moved in the right direction. He will say triumphantly, he will speak of your father as a creative artist. He admired the man, weakened as he was, by the daily dose of carbon dioxide in the hill working in the acrid atmosphere of the dusty fumes. Gold is his medium, which he melts, pours, twists, flattens, refines, chases. You should see him, Maudu would add. You should see him breathe over the flame. His cheeks will swell with the life from his lungs. This life will animate the flame, sometimes red, sometimes blue. Which will rise or curve, wax or win at his command, depending on what the work demanded. And the gold specks in the showers of red sparks and the uncouth song of his apprentices punctuating the stroking of the hammers here and the pressure of the hands on the billow there will make bypassers turn round. I said to, your father knew all the rights that protect the working of gold, the metal of jeans. Each profession has its code known only by the initiated and transmitted from father to son. As soon as your elder brothers left the heart of the circumcised, they move into this particular world, the whole compound source of nourishment. What about your younger brothers? Their steps were directed towards the white man's school. Hard is the climb up the steel hill of knowledge to the white man's school. Kindergarten remains a luxury that only those who are financially sound can offer their young ones. Yet, it is necessary, for this is what sharpens and channels the young one's attention and sensibility. Even though primary schools are rapidly increasing, access to them has not become any easier. They leave out in the street an impressive number of children because of their lack of places. Entrance into secondary school is no panacea for the child at an age fraught with the problems of consolidating its personality with the explosion of puberty. With the discovery of the various pitfalls, drugs, vagrancy, sensuality, the university has its own large number of despairing rejects. What will the unsuccessful do? Apprenticeship to traditional craft seems degrading to whoever has the slightest book learning. The dream is to become a clerk. The trowel is spent. The heart of the jobless swells a flood of delinquency. Should we have been happy? At the desertion of the forges, the workshops, the shoemaker's shop, should we have rejoiced so wholeheartedly? Were we not beginning to witness the disappearance of an elite of traditional manual workers? Eternal questions of our eternal debates. We all agreed that my dismantling was needed to introduce modernity within our traditions. Torn between the past and the present, we deplore the hard sweat that would be inevitable. We counted the possible losses, but we knew that nothing would be as before. We were full of nostalgia, but were resolutely progressive. So Long a Letter by Maria Maba Chapter 9 Maudu raised you up to his own level. He, the son of a princess, and you, a child from the forges. His mother's rejection did not frighten him. Our lives developed in parallel. We experienced the shifts and reconciliations of married life. In our different ways, we suffered the social constraints and heavy burden of custom. I loved Mutu. I compromised with his people. I tolerated his sisters, who too often would desert their own homes and encumber my own. They allowed themselves to be fed 
and petted. They would look on without reacting as their children ramped around my chairs. I tolerated their spitting, the phlegm expertly secreted under my carpet. His mother would stop by again and again while on her outings, always flanked by different friends just to show off her son's social success, but particularly so that they might see at close quarters her supremacy in this beautiful house in which she did not live. I will receive her with all the respect due to a queen and she will leave satisfied, especially if her hand closed over the banknotes I had carefully placed there. But hardly would she be out that she would think of the new band of friends she would soon be dazzling. Moda's father was more understanding. More often than not, he would visit us without sitting down. He would accept a glass of cold water and would leave after repeating his prayers for the protection of the house. I knew how to smile at them all and considered to waste a useful time in futile chatters. My sisters-in-law believed me of spread of the drudgery of housework. With your two housemaids, they will say with emphasis, try explaining to them that a working woman is no less responsible for a home. Try explaining to them that nothing is done if you do not step in, that you have to see to everything, do everything all over again, cleaning up, cooking, ironing. There are the children to be washed, the husband to be looked after. The working woman has a dual tax of which both halves, equally odious, must be reconciled. How does one go about this? Therein lies the skill that makes all the difference at home. Some of my sisters-in-law did not envy my way of living at all. They saw me dashing around the house after a hard day at school. They appreciated their comfort, their peace of mind, their moments of leisure, and allowed themselves to be looked after by their husbands who were crushed under their duties. Others, limited in their own ways of thinking, envied my comfort and purchasing power. They would go into raptures over the many gadgets in my house. Gas cooker, vegetable grater, sugar tongs. They forgot the source of this easy life. First up in the morning, last to go to bed, always working. You, I said to, you forsook your family in-law, tightly shut with their head dignity. You will lament to me. Your family in-law respects you. You must treat them well. As for me, they look down on me from the height of their lost nobility. What can I do? While Maud's mother planned her revenge, we lived. Christmas Eve parties organized by several couples with a shared cost equally and we held in tents in the different homes. With our self-consciousness, we revived the dances of yesteryear. The lively begin, frenzied rumba, languid tangos. We rediscovered the old beating of hearts that strengthened our feelings. We will also leave the stifling city to breathe in the hairy air of the seaside suburbs. We'll walk along the core Cronish, one of the most beautiful in West Africa, a sheer work of art wrought by nature, rounded or pointed rocks, black or ochre colored overlooking the ocean. Greenery, sometimes a veritable hanging garden spread out under the clear sky. We will go on to the road of Wakam, which also led to Ungo, and further on to Y of Airports. We will recognize on the way the narrow road leading further on the Almandis Beach. Our favorite spot was Ungo Beach, situated near the village of the same name, where old bearded fishermen repaired their nets under the silk cutting trees. Naked and snorted children played in complete freedom when they were not frolicking about in the sea. On the fine sand, washed by the waves and swollen with water, naively painted canoes awaited their turn to be launched into the waters. In their hollow small pools of blue water were glistening, full of light from the sky and sun. What a crowd on public holidays! Numerous families would stroll about, thirsty for a space and fresh air. People would undress without embarrassment, tempted by a benevolent caress of the iodized breeze and the warmth of the sun rays. The idol would sleep under the spread parasols. A few children 
spade and buckets in hand, will build and demolish the castles of their imagination. In the evening, the fishermen will return from their laborious outings. Once more, they had escaped from the moving snare of the sea. At first, simple points of the horizon, the boats will become more distinct from one another. As they drew nearer, they would dance in the hollows of the waves, then would lazily let themselves be dragged along. Fishermen would gaily fell their sails and draw in their tackle, while some of them would gather together the wrangling catch, others would wring out their soaked clothes and mop their faces. Under the wandering gaze of the caves, the live fish would flip up as the long sea snake would curve themselves inward. There is nothing more beautiful than a fish just out of water, its eye clear and fresh, with golden or silvery scales and beautiful glowish glints. Hands will sort out, group, divide, we will buy a good selection at bargain prices for the house. The sea air will put us in good humor. The pleasure we indulge in, and in which all our senses rejoice, will intoxicate both rich and poor with health. Our communion with deep buttonless and unlimited nature refresh our souls. Depression and sadness will disappear, suddenly be replaced by feelings of plenitude and expansiveness. Reinvigorated, we will set out for home. How jealously we guarded the secret of simple pleasures, health giving remedy for the daily tensions of life. Do you remember the picnics we organized at Sangalkam? In the farm, Maldoba inherited from his father. Sangalkam remains a refuge of people from Dakar, those who want a break from the frenzy of the city. The younger set, in particular, has bought land there and built country residences. These green open spaces are conducive to rest, meditation, and letting off or seen by children. The oasis lies on the road of Rufiski. Maldo's mother had looked after the farm before her son's marriage. The memory of her husband has made it attached to this plot of land, where their joint and patient hands had disciplined the vegetation that filled their eyes with admiration. Yourself, you added a small building at the far end, three small simple bedrooms, a bathroom, a kitchen, you had a hand run built, then a clothespin for sheep. Coconut trees with their interlacing leaves gave protection from the sun. Succulent sapodilla stood next to the sweet smelling pomegranates, heavy mangoes weighed down the branches. Purples, resembling breasts of different shapes, hung tempting and inaccessible from the tops of elongated trunks. Green leaves and brown leaves, new grass and weighted grass were strewn all over the ground. Under our feet, the ants untiringly built and rebuilt their homes. How warm the shades over the camp beds. Teams of games were formed, one after the other, amidst cries of victory or lamentation of defeat. And we stuffed ourselves with fruits within easy reach, and we drank the milk from the coconuts, and we told juicy stories, and we danced about, roused by stringent notes of gramophone, and the lamb seasoned with white pepper, garlic, butter, hot pepper, will be roasting over the wood fire. And we lived, and we stood in front of our overcrowded classes. We represented the force in the enormous efforts to be accomplished in order to overcome ignorance. Each profession, intellectual or manual, deserves consideration. Whether it requires painful physical efforts or manual dexterity, wide knowledge or patience of an aunt, ours, like that of the doctor, does not allow any mistake. You don't joke with life, and life is both body and soul. To warp a soul is as much a sacrilege as matter. Teachers, at kindergarten level, as at the university level, form a noble army, accomplishing daily feats, never praised, never decorated, an army forever on the move, forever vigilant, an army without drums, without gleaming uniforms, this army, swatting trams and snares, everywhere plants the flag of knowledge and morality. How we love this priesthood, humble teachers in humble local schools, how faithfully we served our profession, and how we spent ourselves 
in order to do with Anna. Like all apprentices, we had learned how to practice it well at a demonstration school, a few steps away from our own, where experienced teachers taught the novices that we were how to apply in the lesson we gave our knowledge of psychology and method. In those children, we set in motion ways that, breaking, carried away in their fell a bit of ourselves. So long a letter by Maria Moba, Chapter 10. Modo rose steadily to the top rank in the trade union organizations. His understanding of people and things endeared him to both employers and workers. He focused his efforts on points that were easily satisfied. That made work lighter and life more pleasant. He sought practical improvements in workers' conditions. His slogan was, What's the use of taunting with the impossible? Obtaining the possible is already a victory. His point of view was not anonymously accepted, but people relied on his practical realism. Maudo could take part in neither trade unionism nor politics, for he had in the time. His reputation as a good doctor was growing. He remained a prisoner of his mission in the hospital, filled to capacity with the sick. For people were going less and less to the native doctor, who specialized in brewing the same concoctions of leaves for different illnesses. Everybody was reading newspapers and magazines. There was unrest in North Africa. The disinterminable discussions, during which points of view concurred or clashed, complemented each other or were vanquished, determined the aspects of New Africa. The assimilationist dream of the colonialists drew into its crucible a mood of thought and way of life. The sun helmet won over the natural protection of our kinky hair, smoke-filled pipes in our mouths, white shorts just above the calves, very short dresses displaying shapely legs, a whole generation suddenly becoming aware of the ridiculous situation festering in our midst. History marched on, inexorably. The debate over the right path to take shook West Africa. Brave men went to prison. Others, following their footsteps, continued the work begun. It was the privilege of our generation to be the link between two periods in our history, one of domination, the other of independence. We remained young and efficient, for we were the messengers of a new design. With independence achieved, we witnessed the birth of a republic, the birth of an anthem, and the implantation of a flag. I heard people repeat that all the active forces in the country should be mobilized. And we said that over and above the unavoidable option for such and such a party, such and such a model of society. What was needed was national unity. Many of us rallied around the dominant party, infusing in it new blood. To be productive in the crowd was better than crossing one's arm and hiding behind imported ideologies. Modo, a practical man, led his unions into collaboration with the government, demanding for his troops only what was possible. But he cares he has the establishment of too many embassies, which he judged to be too costly for our underdeveloped country. This bleeding of the country for reasons of pure vanity, among other things, such as the frequent invitation of foreigners, was just a waste of money. And, with his wage earners in mind, he would repeatedly groan, so many schools, or so much hospital equipment loss, so many monthly wage increases, so many charge roads, you and Maudo will listen to him. You were scaling the heights. But your mother-in-law, who saw your resplendent beside her son, who saw her son going more and more frequent to your father's workshop, who saw your mother filled out and dressed better, your mother-in-law thought more and more of her revenge.